and vibrate. Take your phone calls outside of this room. All calls are to be taken outside of this room. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as you see, we have cameras here. They are streaming this meeting. Make sure that when you are speaking, one person speaks at a time. It's for better recording and for capturing everything that's said. Also, as I said, one person at a time speaks. Thank you. All right, we're going to start the gallery session. So speakers come to the mic there. They have two minutes. Uh, Fernando here is keeping time. He's our sergeant of arms. And at the 30 second mark, he will hold up a sign. Once the 30 seconds is over, he'll bang the gavel. That's it. I will touch the mic. It's going to bang the gavel. All right, so um, we're going to start with the gallery once again. Uh, John Doyle, Jacoby Medical Center. I'm sorry, John, real quick. And just remember, the way we've been doing this is two questions at most for one speaker, right? Two questions, and that's it. I'm sorry if I have to cut you off. We gotta get the show on the road. Thank you, John. I don't think I'm gonna inspire that much questioning. Uh, good to see everybody here tonight. Uh, first meeting for me for the New Year, so happy New Year for those of you I haven't seen. I'm here tonight. Jacoby's gonna be undertaking a new initiative that we actually want to do in partnership with the board. It's called the Stop the Bleed Initiative. It's something based out of uh, the University of Hartford, their medical center. They were uh, the medical professionals that treated some of the victims uh, from Sandy Hook. And one of the doctors, their trauma doctor, is actually going to be coming to Jacoby next week to do medical rounds with our staff. And it's his belief, and what he's been working on with the American College of Surgeons, that if regular people were briefed on the proper ways to treat wound care, how to properly do a splint, how to properly close off a wound, how to properly pack a wound, how to properly uh, address chronic bleeding, that will actually be able to save lives in those situations, such as active shooter situations, where seconds count and sometimes medical professionals can't get in. So I know I've emailed Jeremy a couple times and I look forward to working with the health committee and the education committee because we're going to be doing these uh, in community boards 9, 10, 11, and 12. We have a date set up, which I can't remember right now, but we have a date set up in Co-op City uh, for April. And I look forward to working with all of you to make the event a success into community board 11. Thank you. Hi. Yes, Mike. I want to know my So when could we bring this over to our committee, the health committee for board 11? I guess. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I guess it cuts in and out there. Uh, give me a date, I'll come. Okay. Be happy to work with you to make it happen. We'd like to do it in the spring. We're trying to do them all. I had a conversation with uh, Jeremy's counterpart at Board 9. He's very excited about it. And again, CB10, we've already got something set up for Club City. So I want to make sure CB11 gets the same or better treatment. Otherwise, our community advisory board chair is going to chew me out of the meeting. And I don't want that either. Thanks, John. No so, problem. So the next meeting is March 14th, I believe? Yes, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, it's Tuesday. Okay. And it's 4 o'clock. Sounds good. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Shoshana Evans, Urban Abound. Uh, 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Shoshana Evans. I'm from an organization, a nonprofit called Urban Upbound. Um, we're actually based in Queens, but we just started the program in the Bronx specifically for NYCHA residents. One of the developments that we're targeting is Parkside Houses, which is located in Community Board 11. Um, we offer, our services are 100% free. We offer um, financial coaching, one-on-one -on -one budgeting, help with credit, debt management, and just helping the residents to become financially independent and just become financially empowered. So we just wanted to let everyone know that we're in the neighborhood and the work that we're doing for the residents. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dean Hoffman, Joseph A. Morbidoway. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for those who have not, uh, were here last month, uh, we're looking to rename a very short uh, section of Laconia Avenue between Stell Place and Waring Avenue under um, for Joseph Morbido, who is a lifelong friend who was unfortunately lost in Afghanistan in 2013. Uh, he was an LED. Uh, law enforcement professional. Uh, he was with the Navy for 17 years, retired police officer, uh, just a true hero. And uh, his many friends and family would be honored if this uh, little section with about six or seven homes on it on Laconia Avenue would be renamed in his honor. So that's why I'm here tonight. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gina Francis, uh, Allerton International Merchants Association. Hi, Jeremy, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the merchants on Allerton, we wanted to bring uh, to everybody's attention uh, a very thorough health inspector that we had on our avenue this week. And I uh, wanted to bring it to your attention because I really think we need to do something about it. Um, it's not fair that these merchants who are uh, barely getting by in this economy right now, that they have a health inspection a couple of months ago and there's no problems, and then all of a sudden there's a very thorough health inspector that comes in and nails these guys for 31 points. Um, I go to these establishments, I eat in these establishments, I'm very comfortable with the, with the health and safety of these establishments, but when they find uh, every nook and cranny and, and have it out to uh, theoretically shut down these establishments, this isn't fair, and there should be some uniformity when it comes to health inspectors coming into these establishments. Um, he came in, he swept through, and about four or five stores on our avenue were hit with potentially $2,000 fines for all these small incremental uh, charges that are violations by, by every sense of the words. They're, they're a hole in the ceiling that can be easily uh, rectified and, and repaired. Um, we live in New York City. Um, and, and they find one mouse dropping or four, four small mouse droppings and that's a, a large fine. Um, exterminators called, rectified. There needs to be a process where there's a conversation uh, back and forth. So uh, I really hope we can work together. There, there are some places that definitely need to be uh, focused on and, and improved. But when you have establishments that are very healthy and, and strong getting targeted like that, in, in our community, it's just not fair. So hopefully we can work together on that. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, Mark, Mike, sure. Hello. Is there an appellate process? Like, did they give them grades? And then is there a way they can appeal the grade? Or is this just straight fines? They want to find it. They're going to have to go take off a day of work now and go into court in front of the judge. Uh, one of them, by the way, was uh, not even open yet. The inspector was there. He opens at 11 o'clock. The inspector was there at 10.55 and literally barged his way in with the owner um, and, and made him believe that he had to be inspected at that time when he wasn't even ready to serve or receive food. So there will be a complaint filed uh, on, uh, on that particular case. Um, so it, it, it was just, and he was rude, and, and every single one of them were saying the, the exact same thing. There was, there was something about this individual um, that he was on a, a special mission. I think you brought up a very good issue because on Monday Avenue you we've had the same thing. And they had issued violations for mouse droppings or fly droppings or anything. This one particular store was in violation because of her soda freezer, which was behind the counter and nobody goes near it because she didn't have a certain lock. There's no way to put a lock on those doors. And I think the community board should really work 
with the entire community to make sure that our stores can stay open and earn the living that they deserve to do. And I want to reemphasize on how important it, ha it is to have communication with the merchants. So when we have this communication, we want to keep these, these people, especially if there's, there's no real health hazard. But we, we are in, in jeopardy of, of losing them if they, if they fail these health inspections. So, so Gene, so my advice would be that if you have a particular bad inspector, which it sounds like you might have had, is that all those merchants call 3 one file a complaint against the Department of Health. And if they have the exact uh, name, uh, title, tax code ID for the, the employee, they can specifically report that individual. Thank you, and, and we'll go into it. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, Patricia Vicari from the Brock Chamber of Commerce. Okay, good evening, everyone. And I'm happy to be here that I'm from the Bronx Chamber of Commerce and I'm the director, just excuse me, because I have a cold. But I'm here that for all the small businesses and, and big businesses that we can educate you, we can show you that much better ways and you can learn much better ways that will benefit that your business. And for all the women that own their own business, you can, uh, you can become MWBE certification which means that you can also that apply for grants. So whatever information that you're looking for, that I left that my cards with you, that I'm gonna leave that uh, and flyers and, and paperwork that on one of the desks, and, and you can call me with and, uh, any questions. Okay. And, but we're here to help you. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, Gene definitely uh, has had relations with the... I know, Patricia. Yeah, he knows. Yes. Thank you. Patricia. <laughs> So, um, Anel, excuse the mispronunciation, possibly. Anelba Bonilla for um, ACS, Bronx Family Assessment Program. Good evening, everyone. I'm here from the ACS Family Assessment Program, and we're located on 220 East 161st Street. And there we service um, any caregiver of a child who is at an adolescent age. And we offer them services to help them address any issues that they're having with their child. Our program is voluntary, and if the if we speak with the client and offer them services and they are not interested, um, if there's no child protective issue, they can just go and not take the service. Um, another service that we offer families is that if their teenager is missing and they want a warrant for the for the child so that the police can assist in picking up the child, we help them with that. And we are a pins diversion program, so normally families come to us because they want a pins for the child, but. The court is no longer granting pins petitions anymore, and but however, they have this help available for families where we refer them to community-based services to help them address the issues with the teenagers, or we refer to one of four um, general, um, I'm sorry, one of four evidence-based preventive models if those, um, if, when they're available. So for anyone that you might know that's having any problems with their teenagers, um, please feel free to send them to our office and we'll try to help them in the best way that we can. Any questions? Uh, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes? Uh, Joanne? Right. Uh, do you do outreach in the community? Yes, I do okay. outreach. Do you think, I, 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 we're having a health fair. Do you think it would be appropriate if you came to our health fair and just to distribute materials? Yes, for sure. Okay, because it's a health and wellness, and I think it's, you know, treating the whole child and so forth. Yeah. So I'd like to take your information and then perhaps um, it's a Saturday, but you know we could just about there. Thank okay. you. One more question this way. <laughs> Would you uh, explain to them what uh, what the pens is? A PINS is a person in need of supervision petition where if a parent is having a difficulties getting their child to attend school, getting their child to come home on time, if their child is having problems with substance abuse, the parent normally, um, in the past, the parent would have gone to Bronx Family Court and requested that the child be put under supervision of the court. 
and be instructed to go to school and cooperate with services and cooperate with curfew. However, the that, that was costing a lot of money for the city and the courts, so they're diverting um, those cases now to services because they have found in other states that these evidence-based programs are helping families um, in with their crisis situation and they're helping fix problem behaviors in teenagers. So we have programs that have been tested in New York City with ACS clients, and we've had a lower recidivism rate of those families coming back in contact with the system. So this is the help that the city is emphasizing now, so that instead of making parents go to court, waste their work day, work, um, waste the court's time, we instead refer them to services to try to help them fix their issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Estaba, 3231 Herring Avenue. Hello, good evening everybody. Um, that's where I reside and my issue is the fact that random vehicles come and park for months, sometimes a little over a year at a time, and I believe that it's because, <clears throat> excuse me, my avenue is um, non-alternate side of the street parking because the entire block is a resident block and everybody comes out and they clean so I think we really don't need that but it affects us as residents on the block because for the working class that is mainly on that block whenever you come home there's no parking and that's a problem any uh, so we, we have it written down uh, the police are writing down uh, we do get a few complaints uh, quite often, uh, and we do get the vehicles removed, it's just a matter of time, right? So if you know of a specific, do you, off the top of your head, you know of a specific vehicle, is like, a, like a black Mazda, or that's... Uh, yeah, actually, um, to the south end of the block on the left-hand side, there are two vehicles, one I want to say is uh, either white or black, because I honestly can't remember right now. It is an expedition, it does not have any plates or a registration on the on the window, on the windshield, excuse me. And there's also a purple car in front of it, does have plates, has a flat tire, has not moved. And, and you, and you said it's a black expedition? Yes. Okay, is it even or outside of the street? Same side as the Royal Coach or the other side? Opposite. Okay. So as That's you come down the block, it's on the left. If you go up, it's on the right. All right. All right, great, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nelson, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Oh, Don, you had a question? Comment? Yeah, I thought there was a law that uh, no car could stay in the same spot for more than seven days or something like that. Yeah. Um, we were just towing up in the air, me and Jay were just talking, me and Jay were just talking. Uh, we were just towing up in the air, but we'll, we'll revisit that. Thank you. Uh, it's not a problem. Thank you, Commander Alves. Uh, as I said, Nelson Olin Ray Waju um, regarding trailer parking overnight for days. Hi. Thank you, everybody. I have to come here because uh, I've been having this problem more than two years now. I live between Allentown and Kingsland. The and both way uh, goes to the uh, crewway. We have the trailers parking overnight two or three days, even when uh, there's no form. And I complain many times, I've been to the board, I've been to, uh, to the prison 49, I've done many things, they stay there. Especially in summer, we couldn't sleep because they leave the air condition on when they sleep there. I don't know what. I could do because it's bothering me and my family. And uh, I contacted some officers, they said, no, they go back overnight. But uh, the, the, the law in New York City said there's a uh, section 4-0, it said that no trailer could park on the residential street. They've been doing this because they've never been issued any ticket. So I don't know how it will help. Okay, oh, yeah, great. So I'm not sure if you spoke to anyone at all. Yes, that's not true. Okay, well. In the, in the past, and I think this is how I'm going to go I have reported the same type of issue. 
and they were issued summonses by the 49th precinct prior to the new captain coming in. Now, if it's a new event, that's different. And the moment I used to see them, I took a picture and I would send it, and it would be forwarded to 49. So I'll keep my eyes open again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Community Affairs Officer of Sir Van. How you doing, Mr. Nelson? Thank you for you, Mr. Nelson. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson. Hi, this is Detective Jay Sturdivant. Oh, How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. I spoke to you about a month and a half with regards to this, and this information was forwarded over to our traffic safety sergeant to handle. So it, it is correct that we have issued some of the summonses over there on Kingsland Avenue with regards to your complaint. However, we will revisit it, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, members of the board, the, the guests, I have the pleasure and the honor to in introduce our new precinct CEO, Captain Tom Alves. Um, I wasn't expecting such a big house tonight, but uh, and you're on TV. Yes, I'm on TV, so uh, I'm on the spotlight. But I just wanted to give you uh, uh, an overview of. Uh, how to command or, or the precinct did last year in 2016 and how we're doing uh, in 2017. I, I, I speak uh, um, at a lot of the community meetings and, and, and the associated association meetings, and um, uh, I'm excited about 2017. I, I feel very confident uh, uh, with the police officers in the community I have that we're going to have a successful year. Um, just to give you an idea of crime in, in the command, and, and I'll break it down by uh, uh, areas that would be familiar to you. In uh, 2016, we had 1,291 index crimes. Um, that was uh, 45 more index crimes compared to 2015. Um, it was an increase, but in the seven majors, we, we saw a decrease in every single seven major except felony assaults. Uh, the felony assaults, uh, were largely driven by uh, domestic violence felony assaults. Um, so that was the, the majority of our increase, which uh, contributed to the increase of 45. Um, in the Van Ness area, or Sector Adam, accounted for 198 of uh, the 1,291 crimes. That's 15% of the crimes occurred down in the Van Ness area. Morris Park area, which is uh, sectors Boy and Charlie, uh, accounted for 276 of the 1,291 crimes, or 21% of the crime. The Pelham Parkway South, which is Sector David, uh, accounted for 171, or 13% of the crime in the command. Northeast Bronx, or Sector George, uh, accounted for 74, or only 6% of the crime in the command. The Allerton Homeowners Association, that area, which is uh, like Sector Ida, accounted for 124 or 10% of the crime in the command. Huh. Bronx Park East, which is sectors Henry and Eddie for us, accounted for 371 of the 1,291 crimes, or 29% of the crime in the area. That's like the Olin Villain area. Uh, when we talk about the parks in the 49 precinct, um, we only had 14 index crimes in, 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 a, in a park. Uh, 10 of the 14 occurred in Bronx Park East, Five of the 14 were felony assaults, seven of the 14 were grand larcenies, uh, four of which was like unattended property, so they left a pocketbook on the, you know, like on a park bench, and someone grabbed it, and there was credit cards in there, so it was a grand larceny. So, you know, parks are safe. Um, of the 1,291 crimes in uh, 2016, 14% of those crimes were domestic violence in nature. Um, we had 16 additional DV index crimes in 2016 compared to 2015. Again, that's what caused the increase in crimes in the, in the 49 precinct. Every other seven major, we saw a decrease in, uh, including uh, shootings and violence. There were six shootings last year. In 2016, in 2011, there was 11 shootings. Uh, I contributed that to the, the large case takedown up in East Chester, that gang takedown. Uh, last year, we had um, uh, zero shootings up in Sector Ida. Uh, the year prior, we had four. So that uh, 
and hearing uh, from the residents up in East Chester, uh, it's really paid dividends for them. It's, it was a peaceful summer for them. They were able to go outside uh, and enjoy uh, the summer, and uh, they're looking forward to 2017. So it was it was a success, and Bronx Gang uh, uh, really helped us out, the person. When we talk about housing, housing crimes in the 49 in 2016, only 5% of uh, uh, the crimes in the 49 occurred on housing development, actually on development. So 66 of, uh, of the 1,291 crimes occurred on housing development. Large majority of them were up in East Chester and they were domestic violence in nature. Um, so we're making good strides in housing. Uh, we've implemented a, a very similar program to the NCO program you know, up in housing where we've where we designated two officers to every housing development, East Chester, Parkside, and, and the Coops actually we're counting in, in, in as part of our plan, and Pound Parkway. So there's two dedicated officers in, in each one of those developments interacting with the, uh, the residents there and uh, listening to their complaints, g gathering information, and addressing the crimes uh, directly um, with the residents. So they're interacting with them, their cell phones, and, and uh, via, via email. So that we introduced that because eventually the 49 precinct is going to turn into an NCO command. So they're going to operate, or we're going to operate that in that same fashion in the sectors. And you're going to have that direct contact with the officers. Right now, it's just being in, uh, instituted in housing. So eventually, it's going to come into the command. So uh, I figure we hit the ground running, and, it, and it's working out well. Um, in 2016, 16, if, when we talk about specific crimes, in 2016, 69% of uh, our robberies in the command occurred in the Van Ness Pelham Parkway South and Bronx Park East area. There were uh, Bronx Park East, which is our sector, Henry Eddy. Uh, they were number one and number two in sectors uh, for robberies. So if a robbery was going to happen, it's going to happen in either, uh, it's going to happen in sector Henry, Eddy, or David, um, which is Pelham Parkway South. Um, when we talk about Sector Eddy and, and in Bronx Park East, we're talking about a lot of robberies after school, youth on youth. Uh, we've made good strides with that. We have a plan in place. Uh, we have uh, cops uh, put out a lot of resources after the schools to uh, prevent these robberies from happening. And if they do happen, we're making, uh, uh, we're making the arrests. So uh, we're making good strides in that. Uh, when we talk about grand larceny autos, uh, auto theft, or burglaries, uh, in 2016, 50% of uh, my grand larceny autos and my burglaries were happening in Pelham Parkway South, the Van Ness area, and Morris Park. <coughs> Morris Park was number one in Berks and number one in GLAs. Um, so you can see, when I'm looking at these numbers, you can start to realize how I'll put my plan together. I'm deploying to stop these crimes. Not necessarily domestic violence crimes that happen inside with a known uh, uh, um, perpetrator, which is a family member or uh, an intimate partner. Um, we have other um, means to prevent those type of crimes, home visits and, and, and counseling. But when I'm, when I'm deploying the resources, the cops, I gotta look at the crime and, and determine where's my crime happening? That's what times are they happening, and these are where um, I'm sending my officers. Um, so when I look at my crime, last year, 50% of, of my overall crime, 57% of the 1,291 crimes in 2016 occurred west of Williams Bridge Road. So I have to focus in that area. Morris Park, I have uh, uh, officers right now, and, and Ben S., uh, I have officers dedicated for my burglary problems down in that area. Um, burglaries really uh, caught me off guard in 2017, started 2017. I had two individuals come into the command, not Bronx people, but they moved into the command and somehow got here. Uh, transplants from Brooklyn, uh, they came in and they hit me hard down in, in, in the, or hit us hard down in the Van Ness area. And they did multiple burglaries, so it drove up our burglaries already in 2017. Um, but I'll speak about that in a minute. When we talk about violence, uh, again, in, in, in 2016, we had shoot, six shooting incidents in 2016. Um, six too many, but it was five less than 2015. 2015, there was 11 shooting incidents. Again, the East Chester gang takedown, 
uh, definitely helped us. That's the difference. I'm, I'm saying two of them were homicides, uh, four were non-fatal shootings. Then on top of those six, uh, six uh, shooting incidents where someone was struck, we actually had 19 shots fired uh, incidents where we actually collected ballistics off the ground. No one was hit, but we counted, we investigated. Um, so that so you had those two together, we had 25 shooting incidents. Uh, six where someone was hit, 19 where we had ballistics. 20 of those 25 uh, shots fired incidents uh, occurred in Bronx Park East and Pelham Parkway South. So everything's over there. Everything's north of Pelham Parkway, west of Williams Bridge Road, and, and we had uh, a couple like Kruger lighting area. Um, so that's where my violence is. Um, when we talk about uh, home invasions, in, uh, I know home invasions have become a concern in the 49. You heard a couple uh, on the news recently. In 2016, we only had two. This year, we already have three. Um, and I'll speak to those uh, uh, that uh, I guess was mentioned in the media and are of concern. Um, in 2016, we had 14 commercial robberies versus 20 in uh, uh, 2015. So we saw a uh, decrease of six. So now we roll into 2017, we got a plan in place. I'm liking the plan, it's going well. We already got a 9.6 uh, uh, percent decrease in, in crime. Uh, downtown has uh, graced us with 17 additional cops in 2017, which is great news. Um, my biggest concern is we're winning every single seven major right now, except for Bergs, and again, felony assaults. Felony assaults are still being driven, domestic violence in, in nature. Uh, we have additional six felony assaults, uh, domestic violence felony assaults compared to last year. And that's what, why we're, we have an increase in uh, uh, felony assaults in, in 2017. Our burglaries, like I said, um, I started taking multiple patterns down in uh, the Van Ness area, Sector Adam. It's one guy, Bitch Rosario, who's wanted. Um, we stopped them up in, in the Allerton White Plains Road area before he, he committed his crimes. We identified him, and then he went down into Van Ness, and what he did was, in, within like 24-hour period, he did four burglaries. He was just going down the street, opening doors, walking into residence. Um, we identified him, great work by the uh, detective squad. Uh, they, we got video of him, and uh, he's wanted. Uh, we don't think he's around here, but he had ties to the Unionport uh, uh, Road area. So he's wanted, and he, he did four. And another guy, same area, uh, Apinar uh, Vasquez, uh, hits twice, hits in two commercial establishments. Uh, with the help of the community, uh, we identified him, and he was arrested. Um, so those two individuals really accounted for my increase in burgs in 2017. They were really uh, doing damage right, right, right down around in that area. Some of the crimes that are going on right now that I'm concerned about, uh, you should be aware about uh, LA Fitness and, and Planet Fitness, the uh, uh, two uh, uh, gyms in the area, uh, are having uh, uh, locker break-ins. So we have individuals that go in there, uh, and snap the locks and take uh, credit cards and wallets out of the lockers. I'm trying to work with uh, uh, those facilities to put cameras outside the locker room and, and, and keep tabs on who's coming and going in, in, in these uh, uh, gyms. Um, this is not a new type of crime. This is something that is all too common. It's been going on for a long time. It comes and it goes and comes and goes. But uh, they're happening now. So they're, they're driving. Uh, I'm taking some grand larcenies, so or we're taking some grand larcenies as a result. We also got a car break in patterns. Uh, that's one of the first things I seen uh, when I came to the command. I'm reading all the complaints that are coming. Uh, every single complaint that comes into the four nine I read. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm saying car break, car break, car break. And it's not even a specific area. It just seems like it's all over the command. I try to tell people like, this is a crime of opportunity. Some people are drug addicted, they have issues, they walking down streets, they're looking in cars, and they see the opportunity. Well, 
if, if 